Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Lead us, our Father, as we study today in Jesus' name, honor thy word for Christ's sake, amen. Now, in Acts chapter 10, We read of the message that God gave to Cornelius, who was a devout man. He feared God, he prayed, he gave a lot of money. And he was sincere in what he was doing. And I said that God always gets the message and the light to a sincere seeker of truth. If you are sincerely seeking truth with an open heart and an open mind, if you'll go to the Word of God, I'll assure you that God will give you the truth. Now... When God spoke to Cornelius, he also spoke to Peter. And he showed Peter in a vision that Gentiles were no longer to be classified as dogs or unclean. And Peter, of course, received the message, and Cornelius sent three men, and Peter met them at the door. Now, today we begin with verse 23. But first of all, let me read verse 22 again. This is Acts 10, 22. And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, see, now he feared God, and a good report, he had a good report, he was an honest man, he was an upright man, he was clean, but he didn't know Jesus, and he was had a good report among the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words, to hear words of thee. Now when we reach verse 34, And following, we'll learn about the words that Peter preached in the house of Cornelius. Now, I have a booklet that we call Words That Bring Salvation. Let me point this out today. Jesus saves when we hear the word. In John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word. Not not he that seeth a vision. Now, let me show you something. Cornelius saw a vision. uh, Rather, he, he saw the angel. Peter saw a vision. Cornelius saw the angel, and he talked with the angel, and all that. But that doesn't save us. Suppose an angel should come in your room today. The angel couldn't save you. The angel could warn you, but he couldn't save you. Now, the thing that I want to drive home today, because some of you may not be alive. You may be dead when we reach verse 34. You may be dead. But let me show you now in uh, in chapter 11 and verse uh, 14, 13 and 14. Let me read this because there may be somebody listening to me that'll be in your grave when I reach the, the last part of this chapter. Now look at this in Acts 11, 13 and 14. Peter is giving his testimony concerning the visit to the house of Cornelius. In verse 13, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname Peter who shall tell thee words, W-O-R-D-S, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. He'll tell you words. Now, beloved, I cannot emphasize that too much. I cannot emphasize this today too much, because the only way for anyone to be saved and made fit for heaven is the Bible way. Now, Jesus said, except a man be born again. But how are we born again? In 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the Word of God. The Word of God is the seed. The Word of God is the seed that brings the new birth. The Word of God is the seed that brings salvation. And apart from the Word of God, you cannot, no one can be saved. You can't be saved, nor anyone else can be saved apart from the Word of God. The Word of God is the power of God unto salvation, the seed of God unto salvation. The Word brings saving faith, and the Word brings light. And in James 1.18, we read, Of his own will begat he us through the word. So you must hear the word. And God said, Cornelius, you send a Joppa. You get Simon Peter, and he'll come to your house and tell you words whereby you and all of your house will be saved. Now verse 23, Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now Peter took along with him some of the Jews, some of the brethren, and of course they were Jews, as we'll learn in the last part of this chapter. 
Peter kept these three men, that is, they spent the night with him. And then the next day, Peter and some of the Jews went. Now, verse 24, And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them. They see, he was waiting for them. Now, let me tell you something, beloved. One of the saddest things in my ministry today, one of the saddest things, I'm talking about when I'm in meetings. And of course, for the past weeks, months now, I haven't been in meetings. I had to cancel all my meetings because of my health. And of course, it takes all the strength I have to do the radio and the dictation for the books. But one of the saddest things today is the lack of concern. People are concerned. Listen, folks are not concerned about their eternal destiny. The average person is living today, planning today, working today for that hour when they will retire. Now, that's all right. I, I'm, I'm for it. I'm for it. In other words, I think when a person works hard over a period of years, I think they should be allowed to rest. And I'm not against retirement. Now, don't misunderstand me. But there are more people trusting in Social Security and retirement than are trusting in God Almighty and Jesus Christ. Now, Cornelius was anxious, he was concerned, and when Peter arrived in the city where he lived, Cornelius was waiting for him. He was anxious. But I'll tell you, brother, you, you, today you have to beg and beg and plead and invite and sing and keep on singing and keep on begging to get people to come forward to be dealt with and prayed with. So, when Peter and the other fellows arrived, Cornelius was there waiting. And the morrow after they entered Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Now Cornelius had called in all of his family, all of his relatives, and not only his relatives and family, he called in his friends, his near friends. Verse 25, And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, Cornelius didn't know any better. Now, if he had known, he wouldn't have done it. And so Peter set him straight. But Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Now, he said, Get right up. Now, this business of bowing and stooping and scraping before men. Let me tell you something now. Let me say this in love, in tenderness. You don't owe me any honor. You don't need to call me reverend. Just call me Brother Green. Just call me Preacher Green, just call me evangelist. You don't need to call me reverend. Now, you don't need to fall down at my feet. Listen, I want you to respect what I stand for. I want you to respect the gospel I preach. I want you to reverence the gospel I preach and what I stand for. But I'm just a poor old good-for-nothing hell-deserving sinner that God saved by His grace. So Peter took Cornelius by the hand and he said, Stand up! Now there are men today, there are men who are getting the praise and the worship and the honor and the adoration that should go only to Jesus Christ. Bless your heart. Some people, if their favorite is not going to be there, they don't go to church. No, sir. If the one that they uh, believe in and trust in, now don't misunderstand me. You should love your pastor. You should respect him. You should esteem him very highly. But don't forget, he's just a man, just a man, and I don't care who it is. Doesn't make any difference. Name them all. Name them all. There is no man on the face of this earth today that you should bow to. You're not supposed to bow to anybody. Call no man father but God and bow to no man but God Almighty. You're not supposed to bow down to anybody. Now, we have religious dictators, religious bosses, and religious uh, rulers today, and they've made lords. They've, have, they, they've appointed themselves a lord over God's heritage. And so far as the New Testament church is concerned, there are no muckety-mucks and big shots and little fellas. We're all uh, priests and kings of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. So just remember, Peter said, Get up, Cornelius. Now, verse 27, And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together, great crowd. And he said unto them, Ye know, now watch this, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come in unto of another nation, but God, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now, we talk about the uppers and the middles and the lowers, the upper class, middle class, lower class. We talk about the elite and the scumbum. 
Well, now, let me tell you something. Jesus died for the elite, and he died for the scumbum. And so far as God Almighty is concerned, the gutter, the doper, the liar, the thief, the poor, wretched, miserable man or woman that is in the gutter on the street of forgotten men is just as precious in the sight of God as the banker, the doctor, the lawyer, the president, the governor. Now, God Almighty sees an eternal spirit, an eternal soul, a living soul. And so far as God's concerned, no man is common, no man is unclean. Jesus died to save all men. Now, of course, all men are sinners. All men are ungodly. All men are wretched who are not born again. That goes for the banker, the doctor, the lawyer, the president, the governor, the ruler, the king, the queen, anybody. They're unclean from the spiritual aspect if they're not born again. But you're not supposed to look down upon a person because they're not your nationality. Now, God made the races. Now, don't ask me to write a book on where the Chinese came from. Don't ask me to write a book on where the Japanese came from. Don't ask me to write a book on where the Indians came from. Don't ask me to write a book on where the Negro came from. Don't ask me to write a book on where the Englishman and the Russian and the German and the Frenchman and the Spaniard. Don't ask me to write a book on where they came from. God Almighty is the author of races and God Almighty made men that is, God Almighty allowed men to become the different races and the color of skin. Now, let me tell you something right now. If you'll get half as concerned about winning your neighbor to Jesus Christ as you are finding out why his skin is yellow, white, red, black, or tan, or whatever, if you'll just get as interested in his soul as you are his skin, this world will be a better place in which to live. Any man, any man, regardless, white, Red, yellow, black, it doesn't brown, it doesn't make any difference. Any man that is the kind of a man that he ought to be is just as proud of his skin as you are your skin, regardless of your color. If God made you what you are, then you should thank God that you are what you are and give God your heart and give God your body and serve God. And then in that celestial day, hallelujah, in that glorious resurrection morning, praise God, there'll be no races, nationalities, or anything else. We'll be one big family with Jesus, and that'll be glory. And that's the time that we'll have peace and goodwill toward men. As long as the devil stays out of the pit, and as long as sin is rampant, you need not think that we'll ever have peace on earth and goodwill toward men. We have peace in the heart, in the individual heart, but never on earth until Jesus comes. Praise his name. All right. So Peter said, it's not lawful. It's just against the law for me because I'm a Jew. And it's, it's against the law for me to fellowship or to enter a place where a house where other people are. But God has showed me that I should not call anything common or unclean. Now, let me tell you something. If you're the kind of a Christian you ought to be, if you're born again, washed in the blood, saved by God's grace, you won't look down on your fellow man. You won't look down on your fellow man. No, you won't. Now, let's read on. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore what manner ye have sent for me. Now he said, why did you send for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. A man stood before me in bright clothing. Now, here's what he said. He said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard and thine alms are uh, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Now he'll speak to you. All right. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now, hallelujah for that testimony. Cornelius said, Peter, God showed me in a vision, or rather he showed me a man talked to me, and God told me to send for you, and I sent for you, and you're here, and now we're all here. We're all right here, and we're here. In other words, we are here to keep our mouths shut and ears open, and we want to know what God told you to tell us. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Brother, listen. If I could get all the people in Radio Land who tune in this gospel hour. Now, God put me on the radio over 27 years ago. God is the founder, the author, the beginner of this program. When God put me on the radio, I was a poor, 
ignorant young preacher that if I had known what faces me today, then I would have been frightened almost to death. I would have, I would have run. I, I could not have faced it if I had known 27 years ago, over 27 years ago, when God gave me this ministry, if I had known then what I know now, I'd have said, no, Lord, I know, Lord, I can't do it. But now, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could get every home, every man in an automobile, every person in a place of business, every person listening on a transistor, a little pocket radio, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could get you to stop dead still and you'd say, now, Mr. Green, Evangelist Green, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and I'm going to open my ears. Now, you tell me what God told me to t told you to tell me. Now, you tell me, Preacher Green, what God would have you to tell me. Wouldn't it be wonderful? We'd have 10,000 people saved today. Well, now, here's what God told me to tell you. God told me to tell you, except you're born again, you cannot go to heaven, you'll burn in hell. God told me to tell you, except you repent, you'll perish, and you'll never step inside the pearly gates. And God told me to tell you, if you try to get to heaven any way except through Jesus Christ, you're a thief and a robber. And God told me to tell you that Jesus is the door, He's the way, He's the truth, He's the life, and no man cometh unto God the Father but by Jesus the Son. And God told me to tell you that if you'd hear the words of Jesus and believe on his name, God said he'd save you. Now, all that I've said is in the Bible. Now, listen to me, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, Spiritualist, Pentecostal. Listen to me. If you cannot remember an experience when you realized your need of a Savior, and you confess to God in your own words that you were lost and needed a Savior, and then you ask God to save you. Now, if you can't remember such an experience, then I warn you, you'd better get one today, or you'll open your eyes in the lake of fire. Now, do you suppose Cornelius ever forgot the day that Peter came to his house and gave him words whereby he was saved? Do you suppose he ever forgot that? I know, Brother Green, but the case of Cornelius is quite different from mine. Let me say this to you. It doesn't make any difference what happened at Cornelius' house. When God saves you, God will work a miracle in your heart. God will put divine nature in your soul and spirit. And God will give you the Holy Ghost. And I'll guarantee you, when you're saved, you'll know it just as positively, just as assuredly, just as definitely as Cornelius did know it. You'll know it if you're born again. Now, let me urge you. I don't care who you are, where you are. Ask yourself the question, have I heard the word? Have I believed the word? Have I received the word? And do I know beyond any shadow of doubt that I'm a born again child of God? Now, if you don't know it, I plead with you right now to stop whatever you're doing, if it is at all possible, stop what you're doing and just ask yourself the question. Then let your own heart answer it. And if you can't remember an experience when you were born again through the power of the gospel, through receiving the word of God, if you can't remember such a time, I beg you to bow your head right now and ask God to save you in the name of Jesus and exercise faith in the word of God. Here is the key that unlocked heaven to me, to my soul. Here's the key. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now I heard that, and I believed that, and I received it, and God saved me, and he'll do the same for you. Hear the word, believe the word, receive Jesus on the terms of the gospel, and God will save you right now, and you'll know it. Father, in the name of Jesus, honor the precious word of God the precious blood of Jesus, and save every soul that's under conviction, especially that poor church member that joined the church, but they've never been saved. Save them by thy grace in Jesus' name. Amen.